good morning everyone and a very warm welcome to the second and final day of the leader camp brought to you by people matters and skillsoft it is an immense pleasure to welcome you all again today i'm yasmin taj managing editor with people matters and it is my privilege to be your host for the day we had an amazing session by tina and elisa on the first day where they shared some insightful strategies and real case studies from their experiences i'm sure it has given you new ideas and road maps for you and your team and today with the session that we have planned for you we will cover steps that organizations can take in creating an inclusive workplace answer questions like how can i include what would it require for me as an individual in behaviors and actions and who and why do i include who are my allies we have an exciting agenda planned ahead of us let me quickly take you to the floor for the day we are going to start with a session on embracing allyship and lead inclusively by rashim moga customer market leader and gm leadership and business skills of rashim is responsible for driving innovation and growth in her role as customer market leader leadership and business solutions her role concentrates on leading the content platform customer success sales and marketing teams to deliver compelling experiences to the customers recognized by business chief usa as a woman to watch rashim is an industry influencer a thought leader and a best selling author she is also a recipient of women empowerment game changer woman of the year women tech and silicon valley women of influence awards and was inducted in alameda county hall of fame in 2020 well what's interesting today is that in the later part of the session we will be hosting a power pack panel chaired by michelle bukov page chief marketing officer skills of and to join us as our guest panel speakers we will have kareen roland people and culture leader apac and me manpower group and fiona shepper deni leader anz johnson and johnson along along with rashim moga welcome everyone and now without further ado i'd like to hand over to rashim and request her and we will request our audience to keep posting your questions in the q and a tab and comments in the chat section we would like to make this uh, in the, this session as interactive as possible so keep pouring in your thoughts here keep sharing your questions and we will ask our questions to our speakers towards the end of the session and if you have specific questions for rashim do put them in now because we'll have a q and a session with rashim at the end of first session as well so over to you rashim looking forward to some interesting insights from you Thank you so much Yasmin. Hello and welcome. Again my name is Rashi Moga and GM for leadership and business vertical at Skillsoft and my pronouns are she and her. I'm passionate about empowerment through enablement and 20 years of my leadership career in companies like Oracle, AWS and VMware has been focused around enabling people. I have been on my DEI journey for about 10 years now and I'm excited to be here today with you to talk about why diversity is important from a business perspective and then how to build inclusive leadership. But let's not make this conversation a one way conversation though. Every time I present I learn so much from my audience. So I encourage you to use chat to share your perspective during the session and if my thoughts resonate with you i would love to hear your perspective on that as well so let's get started i think the most diverse team will produce the best product i firmly believe that this quote from tim cook sums it all up for us in terms of why diversity is important from a business perspective aside from being the right thing to do having a diverse workforce is also a smart thing to do and when we talk about diversity remember that we are talking about diversity across different dimensions we're talking about culture ethnicity gender sexuality age experience ability and expertise we all know that diverse teams are innovative they're resilient because they draw inspiration from diverse experiences Here's a real life example. A few years back in a hospital in England, it was noticed that the error rates were increasing while moving the patients from the surgical units to the intensive care units. And really, when they dug deeper, they found that these errors could sometimes be fatal, and they were happening because of the coordination issues between the two units. Now, what would most hospitals do to solve this problem? they would look for similar situations in other hospitals and try to implement the solution however given that this hospital team had a diverse uh, team 
they actually drew inspiration from Formula One racing. They looked at how the pit stop crew actually operates and coordinates within those five to 10 seconds when a car stops in the pit for refueling and for tire check and applied those techniques into the patient transfer model. When they applied this solution, the error rates dropped down drastically. Now, here is a great example of how a team thought out of the box, drew inspiration from a different field, and came up with an innovative solution to solve the problem. Now, inclusive workplaces have financial benefits for businesses, and that's why diversity is a key initiative that businesses are focusing on today. Organizations realize that their people are their biggest assets, and the only way they can grow and meet their business goals is by creating diverse and inclusive culture. Now, there's a recent study that was done by McKinsey. It was conducted on more than 1,000 companies in 15 countries. And this study found that organizations that were diverse were more likely to outperform on profitability. Let's dig deep into this data. So the companies that had gender diverse executive teams were 25% more likely to outperform on productivity. This likelihood increased to 28% if the board was gender diverse. And if there is ethnic and cultural diversity amongst, amongst executives in the company, the likelihood increased to 36%. These are some big numbers that we are talking about here. But let's talk about the flip side. What happens when diversity is not in the forefront of productive development? We have all heard about bias in AI algorithms and data sets that impact our daily lives. Now, coming from a technology background, I'm going to pick up a few examples from there. A common example is the gender recognition app, which can correctly identify a person's gender from the photograph. These apps are beautiful. They are accurate 99% of times, but only for white men. For dark-skinned women like me, the accuracy drops to just 35%. Another great example of when technology is not put in, when diversity is not put in the forefront of productive development is Apple's health app. When it was launched in 2014, it forgot to take into account the tracking of women's reproductive health. Now, there was so much negative press around it at that time that Apple had to quickly fix it in iOS 9. But one thing to remember is that at that time, 70% of Apple's workforce was male. And there was even a smaller number of women in the product and engineering teams. So no wonder the app forgot to take women users into account, right? They probably had no women in product or engineering teams that developed that app. These examples, though, are just tip of the iceberg. There are numerous ex such examples where products, solutions, and businesses have failed because they did not put diversity in the forefront. Now, aside from revenue numbers, by including DEI in the fabric of an organizational culture, organizations create a global think tank of innovation. The 2016 Boston Consulting Group study shows that innovation jumps once the proportion of female managers within an organization rises above 20%. Other benefits of DEI are increase in employee engagement and higher retention of talent because people want to be a part of an organization where their opinions are valued and where they, when they feel that they belong. Now, by creating an organizational culture that values diversity and inclusion, organizations can build a strong leadership bench and attract high value talent. So then if diversity is this important, how can we build a diverse culture? Now you have the power to effect the change by being an ally. By taking that time and making a conscious effort to support and amplify underrepresented voices. 
the first step to being an ally though is asking why for me i came to this country about 15 years ago as a woman of color in technology i had my own set of challenges and biases that i dealt with and going through those experiences it was clear to me that i wanted to play a part in making this world an equal world for all i also had a very unique position i was from an underrepresented group but i was also an ally for other marginalized groups so knowing my purpose knowing my why helped me when the journey was hard so as you think about being an ally i urge you to ask yourself why do you want to be an ally do you want to effect change because you believe that there is inequality in the world do you want to level the playing field for marginalized groups or is it because of your business goals have that honest conversation with yourself to help you decide on your next steps the dei journey is not an easy one you will have to confront biases yours and others you'll have to be persistent and you'll have to stay strong there will be times when your motives will be questioned knowing why you embark this journey will keep you motivated now it takes humility and continuous learning and courage to proactively create a better workplace allyship does not happen overnight it comes from a daily commitment to dig deeper and to demonstrate inclusive behavior and action and in this journey we'll all make mistakes we're born to make mistakes the key is to embrace the discomfort of feeling unsure and use that discomfort to dig deeper now you can become an ally by identifying barriers for various underrepresented groups look for barriers like being left out of meetings not being considered for stretch assignments or promotions and being talked over in discussions as an ally look for these barriers and intervene in positive ways advocate for inclusion in team meetings discussions and projects and look for opportunities to sponsor and mentor underrepresented individuals now as an ally you must take responsibility to educate yourself by participating in trainings and doing your own research early on in my journey as i was embarking the journey to allyship i had a lot of questions and i found myself going back to people individuals from marginalized groups and asking those questions and i noted that it put an extra burden on themselves on them it's not up to the underrepresented groups who are already navigating that structural bias to to educate allies on dei challenges that they are facing it's not up to them as a team we have to hold each other accountable in a constructive way we have to educate ourselves and recognize that everyone is on a learning curve now by demonstrating allyship publicly you can set an example you can educate others and you can contribute to an ally culture where these inclusive behaviors then become a norm and some examples of these actions are participating in events in the honor of different groups pride month is coming up sign up for that uh, if there are any events happening using inclusive language and calling out non inclusive behaviors like subtle microaggressions another actionable step is to state your pronouns as you introduce yourself now many people have asked me before so i'll address it over here why stating pronouns matters by stating your pronouns you make people feel included you make them feel respected and you remove the assumption from the equation and you normalize it for others from the marginalized groups to actually share their pronouns and talk about uh, uncomfortable uh, uncomfortable uh, you know uh, situations another actionable step is to advocate to make your workplace accessible for differently abled and neurodiverse coworkers 
So as leaders, as you start thinking about it, think about the unique position that you have to be the role models for allyship and influence decisions to foster diversity at work. Now, also as a leader, you have a big role to play when it comes to becoming, building that inclusive culture in your organization. There was a study that was conducted which said that what leaders say and do makes up to 70% difference as to whether an individual feels welcomed or, and included in an organization or not. That's a huge responsibility. And that's why inclusive leadership is so critical to an organization's success. So let's talk about how we as leaders can lead inclusively. Start by sharing your diversity goals. DEI is a journey. And every company and every individual is at a different point in this journey. As you start thinking about building inclusive, te include, inclusive teams, think about your goals and then publish those goals or share them with your team. Now, this makes your intention clear to your team. And, and essentially what it does is it sends a message that you are serious about building a diverse and an inclusive workplace. It also encourages your team to hold each other accountable to achieve these goals. And then when you start thinking about building your team, focus on hiring diverse talent. Think about writing an inclusive job description that will encourage diverse candidates to apply. There are many tools that are available. You can use a tool called Gender Decoder to make sure that the job requisition that you create is not gender coded. I use this tool often as I write job descriptions for, for hiring people on my team. I just pop it up in that tool. And what it does is it shows me whether I've used the right words or not uh, to invite candidates for, to apply to those positions. It's a great tool. I'll definitely uh, recommend that you give it a try. Now, as you start your hiring process, Talk to your talent acquisition team. Talk to the interviewing team to share your intent of hiring diverse talent. Also clarify to them what diversity means to you because different people have different def definitions of diversity. Now be prepared to address any conscious or unconscious bias during the hiring process. Here I want to share a story with you, an example. About five years ago, I was building out my team and I was hiring for the tech role. Now, I had been a woman in tech evangelist for years and my team knew about that. My talent acquisition manager knew about that. And um, I was very clear when I opened this rec that I really wanted to bring in diverse candidates into the pool with a goal to hire a diverse candidate. Now, we interviewed candidates and made offer to a great candidate who was ideal, perfect for that role, brought in a different perspective, diversity of thought in the team, um, and a unanimous choice. I was so excited about this candidate. When I told about this candidate to my manager, my manager was very surprised at my decision. The first words that actually came out of her mouth were, brush him. Why on earth will you hire a high school computer science teacher who is also a new mother and has been out of the workforce for, a, for over a year into this role? Because she's perfect for this role, I said. And then I went on to explain it to my manager how this candidate's unique background and different perspective added value to the team. She was a perfect hire because she brought in that diversity of thought that we needed to create solutions, training solutions that were important to our customers and provide that different perspective and different lens that we did not have in our team at that time. But that didn't work. It was not an easy task for me to convince my manager. It took a lot of going back and forth uh, and my persistence paid off. This candidate was one of my best hires and excelled in the role. Now, 
I share this example with you to emphasize that practicing inclusive leadership is not always easy. There will be challenges along the way. You'll have to be persistent and you'll have to navigate carefully. The key is to stay focused on your path and not to let go of your purpose to build an inclusive team. But then just hiring diverse talent is not enough. You have to then think about how to build that growth mindset in your team. You have to take your team on the path of the growth mindset. Encourage your team to think out of the box. Encourage them to take risks and encourage them to innovate. This can only happen when you provide your team with the psychological safety that they need so that they feel comfortable sharing their ideas. As a leader, you have to make sure that the team sees failures as opportunities to learn, that the team embraces diversity of thought without fear, and they're willing to bring their unique experiences into the conversations, into the products and the solutions that you are building for your customers. And then finally, hold your leadership accountable as well. Diversity is not one person's initiative. It is an initiative that the entire organization signs up for, and it's everybody's responsibility. DEI is a journey. It's not a destination. And we are all on this journey to make this world an equal world for all. With that, here's to a successful DEI journey. Thank you, and over to you, Yasmin. Thank you, Rashim. Very, very insightful. I love the fact that you shared about how 70% of the uh, of what leaders say and do makes 70% of difference to how, pe how people feel included in an organization. That's a great thought to start our journey with. And yes, as you said, it's a, it's a journey. And uh, let's work towards making a DEI a successful journey in our organizations. Great. And we had a lot of comments coming in, Rashim, and a lot of questions for you also. I'll just quickly try to answer, uh, take up a few of them for you. Uh, an interesting question that I could see was on uh, from Kanan, who says, how would you differentiate between talent and diversity when it comes to choosing the right person for the right job? What would take precedence? The right person for the right job. But how you determine that right person is a big question in itself. When you start thinking about who is the right person, have you made sure that you are bringing in the aspect of diversity of thought? into the conversation. Have you made sure that you are truly bringing in somebody who is right from, from the perspective of the role or have you let your conscious and unconscious bias seep into the process? That is the important part. I truly believe that talent is equally distributed, opportunities are not. So when people say that I could not find the right diverse candidate for this role, I have two questions for them. Have you looked hard enough? And have you removed conscious and unconscious biases from the process to identify what right is? Interesting. Thank you. Yes, talent is available when opportunities are not. And I think that's what we look to dig deeper into and look deeper into. Thanks for answering that, Rashim. Uh, another question we have from Rahab Nadir, who says, how important is male allyship and how does it let you marginalize the DNI journey? So here is the thing. I, I've been a woman in tech evangelist for a long time now. And uh, the reality is that we cannot be successful in the goals that we have without having male allies. And the reason is because, because this world is a mix of different genders and you have to bring everybody along to make it an equal world for all. So it's extremely important. And, um, and really, the conversation, when we say allies, we do not say male allies or women allies, or we don't say cisgender allies. We say allies. And that, there's a reason behind that, because we want to bring everybody together. We are not going to be able to create an equal world if there's not equal participation from everybody. Thanks. Thanks for answering that. Another question that I can see coming in from Shabnam Roy is, uh, please elaborate on how JDs are checked for gender neutrality and which tool can be used for the same. So the tool that I use is called Gender Coder. So if you put it in, in Google, it'll, it'll come up. It's actually 
it's it's a beautiful tool because what you can do is you can just copy paste your entire jd into into that and it'll it'll tell you whether it's 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 inclined to draw more masculine um representation or feminine representation and the the words are coded into into the back end in the database and basically what it does is it checks for those words so to give you an example if you if you if you put in words like leadership if you put in words like um like strong personality it it codes it as masculine but when you put in words like collaborative when you put words like um interpersonal skills it it shows it as a uh, feminine inclined now here is the beauty of this this is not one person's perception it's not even about right or wrong it takes into account the various biases that exist so typically when there is five times in a job description there's a comment on leadership or there's the word, word leadership that's written it discourages women candidates female candidates to actually apply for the role that's the in, that's the history behind it and that's the intent with which the tool has been built it's not about what is right or wrong and whether women can be leaders or whether they can demonstrate leadership qualities or not it's about how our biases work and how diverse candidates apply for positions and how jds resonate with them absolutely thanks thanks for sharing uh, another question coming up from shagun gupta is on the subject of publishing metrics companies do it on a global level which one when drills down to regional and departments the picture isn't as good as it seems what are your thoughts on that so i think first and foremost just publishing those metrics is a great thing because 5 years ago there were not many companies that were publishing those metrics so we have to realize that it's a journey it's not a destination and this unfortunately is a journey that will continue to be a journey for a long long time so so that's the first piece the second piece is that uh, the data and the numbers are influenced at every level so it's not just the responsibility of the c suite to to meet those numbers it it it's it boils down to leaders and managers at every level what happens when you are under a pressure under pressure to hire somebody what do you do you look at the first and resumes that come in and you make the hire do you give your talent acquisition team enough guidance and enough team and share your intent around diversity and bringing in diverse team members when you start looking at opportunities and stretch and assignments do you remove your biases in the process as you start thinking about who should be given those stretch assignments so i think the onus lies on each one of us to improve those numbers great thanks i think uh, it's time for the final question uh, what all should be included in psychological safety training sessions so when you start thinking about psychological safety i think i think the most important thing is organizationally what you have to do is you have to remove that culture of fear unfortunately that culture of fear exists as an, at an organizational level within teams managers should be coached how to how to remove the criteria of success and failure and how to start seeing failures as learning opportunities and that's a big one because if if the managers do not and it's a top down approach if in an organization you do not have a culture of psychological safety it can't be built at a lower level it has to be a top down approach where you as a company think about innovation think about growth mindset think about failure as learning opportunities give people that that psychological safety that it's okay to fail but fail fast right so those are the elements that should go in the psychological safety training but you have to think about who needs this psychological safety training it should start from top down it it's not individuals who need psychological safety training it's the leaders who need that training great 
thanks i think that was all the time we have we have a lot of more questions coming up rashim if you could get time to just go through them and if you can see you can answer them on the chat or in the q and a tab that would be great you could also try and pick up some of these questions towards the end of the session when our panel discussion is over so on that note thank you once again rashim that was indeed very helpful very insightful and now thank you for the opportunity and i do have my linkedin details and twitter details over here so if anybody wants to connect with me offline and continue the conversation i'm totally open to that great thank you thank you so much rashim and now i'd like to welcome michelle bukov byex chief marketing officer skill soft to join us for the panel discussion and further help us by inviting our guest speakers for the day as chief marketing officer michelle michelle leads the global marketing organization focused on helping companies unlock the hidden value inside their greatest asset their people in her role michelle is responsible for the company's marketing strategy to drive growth generate awareness and drive demand for skill soft solutions among learners customers and partners welcome michelle it is a pleasure to host you today and over to you for the panel discussion now thank you yasmin and thank you rashim for a powerful session you know i love that Leila Jana quote talent is equally distributed but opportunities are not and i i am excited to be here with you day, today my name is Michelle Bokoff Fida cuz yes been said or Michelle BB that's what everybody calls me and i use she her pronouns um we have such an amazing panel and i will introduce them momentarily and please do not worry as we get into this i will keep my eyes on the chat pod to ensure that we address your questions at the end of the session and we'll ask Yasmin to do the same but before we begin I want to take a quick step back, right? It has been a year of massive change and disruption for us all and it continues to be so. I I think I would argue that we are at a point in which we find ourselves um beyond anything that we have a playbook for. This is all new and everything that we are living through could really be called a perfect storm of change. And what we've seen are three seismic shifts that have convened that are disrupting business as usual so we've got a global health crisis in covid-19 we have worldwide economic uncertainty as a result and a widespread social justice movement that has in turn caused so many companies to look at their diversity equity inclusion policies as they seek to advance meaningful change within the workplace and today we're going to we're going to talk about that last point and as we just heard from Rosh and building a diverse workplace is not only the right thing to do but it makes good business sense and building a culture of allyship and leading inclusively can help companies innovate while engaging and retaining their employees and you know the data really does suggest that that creating a diverse equitable and inclusive workplace and today I'll I'll refer to this topic as DEI is critical to attracting skilled individuals who can contribute to a company's success. But we also recognize and we've heard from so many of you in the chat pod that companies aren't necessarily where they want to be from a DEI perspective. And aligning policies to the needs of employees and their changing views and making sure that we update those policies regularly will go far to engender trust and instill employee well-being. So during today's panel discussion we're going to spend time talking about the importance of allyship, how we can build cultures of inclusive leadership within our organizations, and again as as Rasha mentioned pursuing real diversity and true equity and meaningful inclusion, it's a journey and we're all on it. We're not going to get everything right, but we are certainly going to continue because it is so critical to our success. So with that content context let's kick this off. I would love to have our panelists introduce themselves and their roles within their respective organizations. You've already met Rashim who will join us, but let's take a moment to meet Kareen. Hi everyone. Uh, I'm very excited to be uh, with you today. So my name is Karen Roland. I'm the head of people and culture at the Manpower Group for the um, Asia Pacific and Middle East region. Uh, Manpower Group is one of the world leading organization in uh, innovative workforce solution and we are present in uh, uh, 80 countries and uh, we have about uh, 30,000 employees uh, worldwide. Wonderful. Thank you. Fiona, would you like to introduce yourself? 
Thank you so much, Michelle, and hi, everyone. My name is Fiona Shepherd. I'm the Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Leader for Australia and New Zealand for the Johnson & Johnson family of companies. So we're a global healthcare company uh, with, uh, I suppose, sectors in pharmaceutical, medical devices um, and consumer goods. I report up through our global Office of Diversity, Equity and Inclusion. However, look after the Australia and New Zealand employees. We have about 1,500 employees across the two countries. So I keep them all together. <laughs> well, thank you for joining us here today. Um, why don't we just go ahead and dive in and let's begin with our first question. And um, Rasham, I'll ask you to answer first and then I'll move on to Karine and Fiona. Um, but but let's begin. How how do you believe that this year has impacted the perception of and commitment to DEI, both in our own organization, but also in organizations that you're talking to on a regular basis? And then I would ask you, how has this year changed the work that you lead personally? That's a great question, Michelle. Um, at Skillsoft, we started our DEI journey a couple of years ago. I think we were very early on during when COVID hit us in that journey. But essentially, I think what pandemic did, and not just pandemic, uh, the events that happened in the United States as well, uh, they fast-tracked the need to, to, to get on this journey and to move faster in this journey. It, they did that for not just our organization, but also for other companies that I'm talking to. With digital transformation and customer centricity, diversity became one of the key initiatives that all companies and all businesses are now focusing on. The events in 2020 actually um, brought people into the forefront again. Organizations always knew that people were their biggest assets, but there was a period when technology and, and other initiatives took the forefront. And I think what happened with 2020 is that pe people came into the forefront once again. So for us, what we are focusing on might not have changed all that much. Diversity was always our focus. But how we are focusing on it and how we are fast-tracking our journey has changed. There's a pressure now to evolve, and the consequences are huge for not evolve if we don't evolve in this journey. So um, we also realized that it, it's hard work, right? It's, uh, we, there's burnout, there's fatigue, there's frustration in the process sometimes. But we also know that, uh, that we cannot, cannot uh, step out of this journey. We have to continue on this journey. So that's what has changed for us, I think. And in terms of, um, in terms of how we lead this work, now Skillsoft is in a unique position. We have an ability to not just influence our teams, but also influence our customers with the content and the solutions that we create alongside this in this journey. So, so that's the beauty of it. So we have been creating programs around DEI. Um, happy to go into the details later on. But also we have been creating those mechanisms and change agents, the solutions that are change agents to help companies think about diversity, not just from a perspective of diversity as a business unit, that sits somewhere in the HR team, but diversity as it is the DNA of a company. I think that's I, I think that's so important, right? Sort of injecting this into the DNA of an organization so that it's it's not something that we do on the side, but it really is part and parcel of everything. And I did see some questions about how do we start to ensure that all departments and all facets of our business are incorporating DEI rather than it being a separate function entirely, right? So how do we start to instill it in practice across the organization? Karina, I go to you and, and ask you the same question. What's changed? What shifted for you at Manpower in the past year? 
Yeah, absolutely. And we add to this that the, the pandemic uh, unfortunately continues to impact bo uh, markets, borders, daily life around the world. And we've seen this uh, recently across our, our region very clearly. So the organizations, they, they need to continue uh, to plan for a certainty and to be built for change. And that's absolutely cr critical. So the, the COVID-19 emergency has demonstrated that we need to be smarter. We talked about um, before being smarter and more agile, in particular to tap in, into more DEI best uh, candidate uh, as we evolve in, in the world of work. Um, it's a matter of fact that inclusive Culture facilitated belongings. We talk about psychological safety and optimism for change, making employees um, feel more connected to their work. So organizations are more likely to achieve better business outcome and, and cascade ROI. So the thing is, we, we don't know how long the situation um, will last and, it's in, and we don't know the impact on the long term, but we do know that with the right people and swift actions, including a stronger DI uh, strategy, we can help manage this challenge and come out stronger out of this crisis. So what we are doing at, at Manpower Group, um, we have definitely put a much uh, stronger emphasis on our DI B uh, strategy and the B for belonging. We have added belonging, the sense of belonging to our strategy. Integrating and including is a pillar uh, of our sustainability plan. Um, we as well, in the last uh, 12 months, um, put much more emphasis on creating a culture of, uh, in, of uh, conscious inclusion in our organization. And lastly, um, as we work with clients um, around the world, so with our client community partner, we, we want to develop and support programs that upskill and reskill underrepresented and underserved population for meaningful and sustainable work. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. I love this idea that we add the B because I think that is very important, right? So if diversity is the mix, if equity is ensuring that we are treating people fairly, if I is, is creating a, an environment in which people can thrive the B is really making people feel like they belong. It's that next level, that next step. So thank you for that. Fiona, I want to turn it over to you because I'd love to understand, particularly in your region, what has changed in the last year and how has it shifted your views on diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging? Yeah. In, in fact, I was just, just thinking then, Corinne, with the B, and I know a lot of my colleagues externally to J&J &J have flipped the acronym to be I and D now, so they're putting inclusion first. So it's inclusion and diversity uh, because I think, you know, inclusion is kind of the harder one to do. Diversity is somewhat easier. So flipping them around, I think, gives it a really different perspective. Mm. Um, Michelle, I think for J and J uh, globally, being part of uh, I suppose a global healthcare company, we have uh, embraced the diversity, equity, and inclusion. So we've moved beyond diversity and inclusion to really look at what equity means. And I think, you know, in each of our countries, it means different things. In Australia, where I'm based, and my colleagues in New Zealand, we have a large population of First Nations people, Aboriginal, Torres Strait Islander, Maori and Pacifica, and it's about acknowledging those First Nations communities. So we've uh, tied that in with a, um, with a program for J&J &J where we're aspiring to eradicate actually racial and social, social injustice as a public health threat. And we're doing that by eliminating some of those health inequities. And so committing $100 million over the next five years to invest in programs that are focused on health equity solutions. And so I think, you know, this to be transparent, it, it's, you know, we're based in the US and, you know, and with the one year anniversary for George Floyd, I think it's today um, or, or this week, um, you know, it came on the wave of that. But our commitment to this very bold action actually covers three areas. It's around a people first culture. So how do we cultivate one of the most diverse and inclusive workforce, workforces that actually inspires these healthcare solutions around the world? 
The second one is around having healthier communities. So how do we as a company help close those racial mortality gaps by investing in some of culturally competent community care programs and models? And we do that through our philanthropic arm of our business because what we want to do is create better health outcomes, especially for people of colour. And then the third part of this, um, this uh, you know, this bold plan that we have around eradicating racial and social injustice is around the enduring alliances. So it's around um, how do we lead and leverage the power of J&J &J and our partnership network to help combat that racial and so those racial and, and social um, det health determinants. So that's been, I think, a big shift for us above and beyond what we already do in that DNI space. It's a big shift externally. Yeah, it, you know, it is. And, and something you said um, really struck me. So Rasha already spoke about the importance of a diverse workforce, right? It's it's smart mm. business. It's the right thing to do mm. for, for both the people we serve internally as well as, as society. And, and we know that um, fostering this, this sense of belonging at work is important. But, you know, really, we have to talk a little bit about the business case, right? How do yes. you actualize the business case and the human case? You talked about the investments that J&J &J is making. How do you begin to actualize that business case and human case for DEI in your organization, Fiona? Uh, you know, it's actually a really interesting question. And I, um, you know, I'm, I'm continually pondering, I suppose, this because there is a lot of rhetoric around there around the value of diversity, mm -hmm. uh, you know, gender, people of colour. Um, they're all, there is still underrepresentation in most companies' senior ranks, let's face it. <clears throat> it's mm -hmm. still there. And, you know, I think this lack of progress that we see suggests that, the, you know, some of those top executives, that they're, they're not finding the business case compelling, to be honest with you. Um, and, and so potentially it's about uh, making the business case more credible and powerful so that it's um, there's that human element, as you said, mm -hmm. um, Michelle. And I think there's three things. So maybe it's, you know, those big grand statements that we have um, or that we've had in the past, how do we how do we make them more sound and more empirically based so that their people can actually see them come to fruition? I think the other thing is that, Business leaders have always wanted to tie a return on investment to DNI as a driving factor. And I get it and I understand it, but I think they really need to just take a step back and have a broader vision of what success looks like, you know, encompassing learning, innovation, creativity, flexibility, and also just, you know, equity and our human dignity as well. Um, and the, the other thing I think is that, um, you know, leaders must acknowledge that by increasing that demographic diversity, it doesn't by itself necessarily increase effectiveness. Uh, and, and so, you know, what matters is how, as an organisation, we harness that diversity, but then we're willing to reshape the power that comes from it. Uh, yeah, and so I think, you know, you could probably drive it down. So, you know, when we think about then actualizing that business case to that human case, what we're always doing, I suppose, is that how do you make it real? How do you make it yes. real for the leaders? How do you make it real for the organization? And I've even looked at a lot of the comments in the chat and the Q&A. The thing about this is like, how do we make it so that people get it? And I think that, that, you know, there's lots of ways that you can do that and we'll talk to it more. But I think in the short term to make sure that you connect that business case to the human case is to probably do some internal assessments, as uh, you know, it, within your organisation. So do a cultural assessment. You need to do a cultural assessment to see what, the experiences of the culture of the company. I think evaluate the readiness of your leadership for DNI 
is another really important thing. And then I think you need to look, do an assessment across your organisation, a really candid assessment about and look at your policies and procedures because they underpin the culture of the organisation. And so I kind of see that actualization of the business case and the human case kind of melding together. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's absolutely right, Fiona. And, and Rasham, I want you to jump in here because I, I think that oftentimes we get so focused on the ROI, but that ROI actually, you have to take into account that people come to a company because of the values, because they see something in that organization that aligns to the values that they hold dear. And we know how important DEI is to people when they're going and looking for a job, when they're deciding whether or not to stay at an organization. So I think this is really important that the business case and the human case are inextricably tied. Rashima, I don't know if you want to add anything to that. Yeah, it's interesting that we are having this conversation, Michelle, when we have profound examples in front of us. We know what Satya Nadella did to Microsoft and how bringing in that that whole thought process around diversity, not just from a perspective of gender diversity or uh, sexuality, but also from a perspective of neurodiverse, Mm -hmm. um, bringing in that neurodiversity into, into the workforce has changed not just the kind of products Microsoft creates, but also the perception and the brand value of Microsoft. And uh, this was not done overnight. It took him a lot of time and he had to drive it. It had to be a top-down approach. And Satya has been really outspoken about some of the, some of the measures that Microsoft took. Actually, they just published uh, a report um, yesterday around how to make returning to work easier for for women and for people who shouldered responsibilities more than just being the breadwinner. But but it surprises me that we still have this conversation and we still have to build a business case around it. Mm -hmm. What also surprises me is, um, is that there is a, there's a perception that somebody has to make that change for us right? Mm -hmm. We need Mm -hmm. to see those numbers. The reality is that a culture of an organization is determined by people and their mindset. And we all are part of the culture. So that's important to understand. And and as we dive deep into this, there there is that conscious effort that needs to be made. You're not hiring people just because you want people of color in your team. You're Mm. hiring them for that diversity of thought. You're hiring them so that you can innovate. You're hiring them because it's going to make a change in how you're going to create products for real life problems, solutions for real life problems. And that is what is the part that businesses need to hone on. It's not about tokenism. It's not about the color of the people or differently abled people that you're hiring. It's the diversity of thought. It's the experiences. It's how it feeds into innovation. And once that understanding comes into play, that's when the magic will start happening. But unfortunately, that hasn't happened at a business level. Agreed. Agreed. I think that there's still far more work to do and in reshaping that perception of how to measure or, uh, of how to build a business case for DEI I think is important. I want to shift a little bit um, and Fiona I want to come to you and talk actually uh, I'm sorry I want to I want to start with Corinne here. Um, I want to move on to allyship. So we know that an ally is any person who actively promotes and aspires to advance the culture of inclusion through intentional positive and conscious efforts that benefit people as a whole easy to define, but really Mm. complex to to implement, right? So we have personal biases, all of us, we have our own experiences, we have our innate perspectives, and that all plays a role in allyship. So Karina, I want to come to you and and ask, how have you been able to instill a culture of allyship in your organization? And then what resources 
And support structures have you built to support allies? Hmm. Yeah, no, it's uh, absolutely a, a key question. And I think uh, Hashim just before covered um, a lot uh, around allyship. And I think if we want to be serious about allyship and equal opportunity, it, it's, we have to go beyond the program. Uh, it, it's about culture, change the culture. And we have to be uh, prepared to take really proactive steps to promote a diverse pool of candidates uh, for senior leadership and board position, train, incentivize manager um, and employee on, on what does it mean to be um, uh, inclusive. Um, I like the fact that we ask as well key question. We talk about the why and, and the why is absolutely critical. But the, the, the following question, what obstacle exists in my workplace for underrepresented colleagues, for example? And I think, uh, Rashim, you talk about this, so I'm, I'm not going uh, deeper into that one. Uh, you just mentioned, for example, the one we are left out of meeting, the one we, we don't hear in the organization. And I think it's very, uh, we have to start with identifying the obstacle. And then it starts with, with me. <laughs> it starts with everyone. Uh, how am I educating myself and engaging to become a, a better ally? So um, we have to take the responsibility for ourselves, uh, participating, organizing training. So be really practical. It's everyone in the organization who is accountable for bringing this um, diversity, inclusion, equity, inclusion, and belonging strategy um, really into life. Um, you mentioned, I think, Rashim, as well before, um, the behavior that I can demonstrate publicly to foster an allied culture in, in, into the organization. And I think um, I, I try to do more and more, and I try as well to convince my uh, leaders or my colleagues to talk publicly about this topic. And I think the more we know, uh, the, the awareness is, is absolutely key uh, as well to, to educate others and to set a kind of, of norm. And um, lastly, whose voices are not represented at um, our organization? So I'm, I'm looking at, for example, in, in our organization, whether it's in Australia, I'm, I'm covering a quite diverse region. You can imagine Japan and India and, and Thailand and Singapore. I, I try to look at diversity in terms of who are the people who are belonging to our organization and to make sure that they have uh, a voice when we um, either organize training, when we are um, events, and when we communicate. Um, and I would add to this, it's um, a lot around personal uh, actions to be um, really um, more inclusive. Um, if you become a sponsor, um, calling out inappropriate behavior, for example, make sure that you can't just live with this. We, we just to have to call out and to make sure that it's not acceptable, for example, to use inclusive language, um, to roll out training on that topic and um, to make sure that it's not only a one-off training, it's regularly that it's embedded in our culture. So we, we talk about the journey of uh, diversity and, and inclusion. For me, a liveship is also a journey and it's a journey of uh, text, uh, humility and we have to continue uh, really, um, yeah, to, um, to, yeah, to continue this dialogue in, in the organization. I think, Michelle, I would, I would like to add um, a little bit of perspective over here as well. Sure. We talk about providing psychological safety to our teams, right? As we talk about the, the DEI journey. I think we have to, as organizations, we also have to provide that same kind of psychological safety to our allies as well. Mm. And that is because we are born to make mistakes. We are, this, this is a disruptive um, space. It's a very volatile space. We are learning new things every day. What was right two years ago is not right today. Right. Or maybe it's in a gray zone. So how do we allies are, I talk to a lot of allies who are continuously walking on eggshells, who do not know what is the right thing to do. And then do they retract back and not be allies or, or do, they, do they deal with the consequences of not being right all the time? So that psychological safety, I think at, as, at an organizational level needs to be passed on to the allies as well. 
No, I think that's, I think that's so important because I, I think so many people are afraid to get things wrong that they're afraid to speak up and speak out, right? And, and we need to provide that psychological safety so that, that everybody can feel as if their voice is heard. Um, Fiona, I want to turn to you on this topic as well, because I think allyship is very important across all organizations. So talk to me a little bit about what you're doing at J&J, this, this, this idea of instilling allyship within your organization. Yeah, I think, uh, look, um, we have a really robust um, governed framework of employee resource groups or employee network groups. Uh, across the globe, we have 12 of these, uh, 12 of these groups, employee resource groups, and they provide significant value for us. They are actually the drivers of inclusion for us. So there's 12 ERGs, we call them, but then we also have 240 chapters. So chapters then are in each of the country. And then the membership of those ERGs, we have upwards of 20,000 members across those 12 ERG groups. Now there's women's leadership and inclusion, there's open and out, there's... Um, there's uh, Alliance for Diversibilities, like there's a multiple number of, of these ERG chapters that are, there are some that are specific country focused and there are some that are more globally diverse. However, what it does is it means that our employees can engage through those networks as allies in a safe space, um, whether because either because they uh, identify personally or they identify because they've got a passion or an interest um, in wanting to support. So I think that's a really important network. I'm also really cognizant that there's, I work for a large organisation, there's going to be people online that are going to be thinking, well, how do I do that in a, in a much smaller capacity? I, I think, you know, it, it's you can create smaller network groups. And when we talk about psychologically safe environments, um, and I loved that earlier example, Rashim, that you used about the hospital team. I think, um, you know, I, I did read that Amy Edmondson is the founder of um, the psychologically safe environment. So make sure you look up her stories. But she talks a lot about teams being able to make mistakes and learn from those mistakes because it's a safe and a trusting environment. And so our employee resource groups enable that but it's also not just the ERGs it's the managers as well and we'll speak more about it um, down the track but I just wanted to say like I think you know an ERG you can set up regardless of the size of your organization it's about having someone that's passionate and someone that's either got some lived experience or um, ha has some knowledge or you know, want to create more awareness. Uh, and the other thing I just want to add around allyship is the other thing we have is mandatory unconscious bias training. Now, mm -hmm. again, that's another mind field of, of conversation because there's many schools of thought around unconscious bias training and the benefit that it does. I think unconscious bias training gives an opportunity to then expand on that and have those face-to-face -face conversations. I, I've been listening to the, you know, diversity of talent and diversity of teams and, and allyship and um, something that always strikes me when we talk about allies and we talk about unconscious bias, so many managers will say to me, oh, I want that person in my team because they're a really good fit. And my challenge back always is what does fit look like? What what do you mean fit? Why is fit important to you? Is it because they're the same colour as you? They're extroverted like you are? They um, went to the same university? So I think, um, you know, the, the allyship is really important, but the allyship comes with other areas as well that need to really be considered and, and that's um, unconscious bias. And I, I saw someone just put a comment in there, what's unconscious bias? My advice is go and Google it. There's loads of stuff there. And I think, um, yeah, it's a, a strong starting point. 
You know, I, I, I agree. And I want to, I want to touch on this topic of employee resource groups. We have an inclusion council at Skillsoft and somebody had asked in the comments, how do we ensure that our, our marketing is diverse and inclusive? And, and I rely very heavily on our inclusion council. We have them review a lot of our materials, especially as we come into things like pride month here in the United States. I want to make sure that what we are putting out there is reflective of not only our culture, but it's going to be well received by those on the other end. And so our employee resource groups or inclusion councils, and, and look, everybody has a different name for these groups that have become the, the sort of lifeblood of our organization um, in terms of helping us Number one, take the pulse of our employee base, right? How are we feeling as a culture? Mm. But number two, ensuring that that we're living our values and that we're holding ourselves accountable to those values because they're the first people to come back and say, no, that's not right. And here's what we recommend. And that perspective, Fiona, I, I have to tell you, has been so incredibly important. Um, Michelle, and I give you an example for us as well. We have, you know, a pharmaceutical arm of our business and uh, it was noticed or noted that some of the clinical studies that were happening weren't diverse because, um, you know, that, that you drugs, pharmaceuticals act different in different demographics, different um, nationalities. And so the, uh, you know, our ERGs were pivotal in working with our global clinical operations team to educate them around the importance of diversity mm -hmm. of groups for, for, for clinical studies. And I think, you know, without those groups, we wouldn't see things like that. That's like a really kind of left of center thing. We kind of wouldn't have thought about years ago, I don't think. Yeah, you know, I agree. And, and we touched on something and I'm going to start with this next question with Rashim and then Korean. I'd love for you to answer as well. But this also came in from an attendee and we've already seen it about training. Um, we use trainings to create inclusive cultures. You know, at Skillsoft, we believe that that learning and growth is the way to ignite change and progress within an organization. And I, I, I know that you share that as well. So I think we have to talk about what innovative learning and training programs we're developing um, for our leaders. But let's be really clear, this is not just about leaders at the top level, this is about leaders throughout the organization. Everybody is a leader when it comes to the topic of diversity, equity, and inclusion. So Rasham, I wanna start with you. Let's talk about what innovative learning and training programs are we developing and are we doing enough? And, and to the anonymous attendee, thank you for asking that question. So um, let me start by clarifying who the, a leader is in today's world. In today's world, as organizations see it, everyone is a leader, whether you are a leader of people, whether you are a leader of processes or you're a leader of projects. So let's have that notion in that definition as we talk through this because um, because that's important. So at Skillsoft, we have embarked a number of initiatives to evolve our processes, our systems, and the programs to continue on this journey of DEI. I think the first and the foremost thing, Michelle, that we have done is we've put our stance on DEI out there. And that's very mm -hmm. important. What is our stance on DEI? Now, different organizations take different stance. Some organizations are bold, like we are. And we put ourselves out there and we say that this is going to be our stance on DEI. We're going to be edgy. We are going to be sharp. We're going to be bold. And we stand with the diverse groups. We are allies. We start from, uh, from bringing that change within ourselves and bringing that change for our customers as well. Other organizations might be pragmatic and they might want to take us, take, a, you know, test the waters first before they try to figure out how edgy and sharp they can be around this. We have had the privilege of working in the industry where our internal efforts and our external efforts are interwoven. So last year, as we started looking at how can we fast track our DEI journey we actually delivered our first live leadership webinar, just like this one, like the one that we are participating in with uh, Lawana Harris, 
She is a certified DEI coach and a Skillsoft partner. We had 9,000 people attend that. And uh, we learned several important things, not just from a perspective of what we need to bring to our customers, but also what we need to change within our organization. So, um, you know, basically to understand what allyship looks like, what are the programs that we should launch? Our inclusion council was actually a result of the conversations that we then had with Lavana Harris around that. Um, some of the initiatives that we are launching, which is around stating our pronouns, for example, is around that. And then the next step was then to basically decide um, what, what are we going to launch in terms of programs and content for our customers to make it to make their journey easy and for them to learn from our experiences because we are sharp, because we are bold, because we are fast tracking our journey. So we released our five DEI courses in April and I hate to call them courses because they're really not courses in my mind. They're actually documentaries. They're real life stories. They are people who, who have shared their experiences. And this is a very unique approach to taking a unique approach that we have taken around content because what we are trying to build over here is a mindset change. It's change management that we are doing. We have conscious and unconscious biases that we all, we can never get rid of them. Biases, there are 180 different kinds of biases that exist that are known right now. And this number is increasing by the day. But how do you bring in that mindset change so that you are aware and these courses are, are people-led. They're real stories. And then there is an expert commentary behind it, but they're not traditional training courses. So if you haven't checked it out yet, to everybody in the audience, you should go and look at these courses. I know a lot of questions were, people were asking questions around what is unconscious bias training? How do we bring in allyship? How do yeah. we bring in inclusion? You'll find those answers. And through these real people and in-person training, interviews, roundtable discussions, what these courses do is they ignite emotion, they ignite conversations and learning for our customers at all stages in their DEI journey. And really having those honest conversations is the first step. So Rasham, you're going to have to go to the chat pod and insert a link or we'll have to get it out to uh, everybody later because all I'm seeing is share the courses, check out the, where can I check out the courses? So um, please, if you could do that, that would be wonderful. Karina, I want to talk to you about Manpower Group and what you are doing from a learning and training perspective, because this is clearly top of mind for so many people. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I will link to uh, training and um, learning with our strategy. When you design training, you look at your strategy, you look at your purpose. Our purpose is to provide meaningful and sustainable work. So it, it's a journey and we are, uh, I'm working on this at, at the moment. So um, I think the, um, again, the strategic piece is absolutely key for, for us to understand what kind of, what the diversity equity, inclusion, belonging means, means for us. And, and then you look at the different groups and to uh, Rashim's uh, point about leader, who are the leader in your organization and what do you want them to, to learn and what do you want them to uh, develop as, as a skill set, but as well uh, tied with, with the diversity piece. Um, I'd like to, to mention one key initiative. Uh, it's more holistic than really concrete training, but it's uh, a culture survey. We launched uh, end of last year and the project is, is Culture Matters. It's a three-year journey in our organization. We partner with EY and we launch a survey to understand how we will evolve our culture. So the starting point and how we would like to involve, evolve. And you could imagine that diversity discussion, diversity pointer absolutely uh, embedded in, in this survey. So we started with the leaders. We rolled out to all our employees. We just received the result uh, about a month ago. So we built focus group. We had about 400 um, employees worldwide to join this focus group and talking about ASICs 
why ethics is so important in our organization. Yeah. To talk about collaboration. How do we collaborate with each other? We, we, we talked just before about the benefits of um, inclusive workforce, creativity, um, think out of the box, being pro more productive. We absolutely all agree, and especially in, in this forum, that uh, a diverse uh, workforce is necessary really to, to, to go uh, and to bring these uh, new ideas uh, into life. So we are really in, in this journey. And it was interesting because when you do an assessment, when you do a survey, it's anonymous. So you look at your workforce and the feedback and regardless of culture, regardless of uh, language, regardless of background, you, you, you get the result live and you, 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 you are able to analyze what our people are telling us about our culture and how we, want, mm -hmm. we would like really to uh, take this feedback and build uh, um, a culture of uh, inclusion. Yeah, thank you, Corrine. And I, I want to stay with you. Um, look, I I, uh, I have written about and, and something that I'm very passionate about is how the pandemic in particular has affected women disproportionately. Hmm. Um, you know, in a lot of ways, uh, COVID-19 has been it, it's been coined the pink pandemic because it has had such a profound impact on the economic and social power and influence of women of, of all identities and across geographies. And I wanna ask you this question first and then Fiona, I wanna to move to you, but what recommendations do you have for organizations, Karine, that are looking to help women re-engage in the workforce, reimagine their careers, reskill for this future of work? Because this is a very um, important topic. And my fear is that we are COVID washing an issue that has been around for decades. And of all of this progress that we've made, I mm. worry that we're gonna sweep this one under the carpet. Yeah, uh, I agree with you. We, we call it the she session in, internally. So basically the, the data are showing us that um, um, as a result of the pandemic, we have we're going backwards in terms of uh, equality mm -hmm. and, and progress. That that that's um, that's the case. And um, as we know, women have taken more responsibility uh, at home, schooling, caring uh, for children and elderly relatives. So I can I can mention a, a lot around this, and uh, and myself as well, uh, having a, a young uh, girl when. Uh, when we had, we're in, um, and again, we're lo in lockdown, uh, just the announcement of the government, we're back to lockdown tonight. So I was really, oh. um, just for a short term, which is fine, but I think a lot of um, our countries are still in lockdown, uh, not to mention India or Malaysia and Singapore uh, across the region. But so um, I've experienced this as well uh, as a woman and um, the impact is double-edged. So women have been pushed out of the labor market by declining roles and also uh, having to opt out so they have to to look at um yeah the priority balancing the home and balancing the the the, the job um and you had to this as well the demand and if i look at uh, especially country not to mention india but uh the demand for role like in uh, IT, cybersecurity, app developer, et cetera, they're predominantly held by men. So how do we make sure that women can, can come to this workforce and can play a, a key role? Because there are so many roles at the moment open on, on the market. So the first thing I think that organizations have to look at is um, to be prepared for hybrid um, work that mm -hmm. accommodates you know, both remote and in-person work options. So we talk a lot about flexibility and I think especially women want more flexibility. And again, if I talk about my personal situation, I have completely changed the way I work. I have completely um, rearranged my schedule and I have um, uh, decided as well to take more time with my family was my little daughter where well, before I was traveling like, like, like crazy I'm not traveling anymore and, and now I can really take time with her so the flexibility is absolutely um, key um, in this environment and there are different ways and I will mention maybe six or seven how we could make progress in, in, a, in a gender parity in a new reality 
uh, and I will come back to the why. So know the why. So um, advancing towards gender parity in the workforce is not only the right thing to do. Yeah? Uh, it's far further. We, we talk about being more creative, be more innovative. And um, I think we have to go beyond the it's the right thing to do and understand why are we doing this. Um, secondly, is uh, setting women uh, up, so setting women up for, for success. So recognizing which obstacle they're facing when they want to grow in the ladder. When the, and I can give you the example of um, great success, but at the same time, I feel we could do better in Japan. And you know how much the, the, it's a challenge as well for women to progress uh, in in the ladder and and to be at, at the top of the organization. But we are building a pipeline so that at least we have uh, in the past year, 50% of promotion are women, which is fantastic. But now my question to my Japanese colleague is how many are now visible in the top 10 of the organization? Because we lost a lot. So we were not able to retain some, again, because of, um, and for, 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 for different reasons, like, setting up for success and making sure that when they progress in their career, we understand what are the main obstacles. Um, another one would be, um, I would say, yeah, ask why not. I, li I like this one, for example, instead of uh, asking, for example, um, oh, she doesn't have this experience of these skills, um, what do we need to make it work? And we tend to see the negative. Let's see the positive so that uh, women are, are bringing, what do they bring to the organization or to the role? Um, and and we come back as well to leaders that need to hone and uh, to measure it. However, we mentioned as well that the fact to, that to measure it, um, we have to be mindful and careful how we measure it and, and how we do bring right. this result to, to the organization. Um, yeah, identify just some skill set as well. What are the skills and the soft skills that are needed in the market? Um, learn ability is absolutely key. So I think we talk a lot about uh, learning. And uh, I think since last year, especially that, that last year, the access to learning is, is tremendous. Mm -hmm. So but it's up to the individual really to continue to, to learn and, and develop their, their soft skills. I agree. And, and Fiona, I think, um, you know, uh, Corinne just mentioned something about measurement. So let, let's, I'd love to get your take on the dimensions that maybe we should be tracking and measuring to achieve mm. a gender balanced workplace and, and some of the KPIs that we might use to measure diversity as a whole. It's actually a really interesting topic. And um working again for a large global company it is um you know we we have challenges around privacy with some of the things that we do measure however we can um we can capture gender and our three managing directors are really passionate about the gender equity you know a, a lot of the things we can't measure but if we can measure gender equity then let's take a deep dive and let's really look mm -hmm. at it so in Australia, we have the Workplace Gender Equality Agency, which have mandatory reporting on uh, gender equity. And this came about a number of years ago. And so any companies with over 100 employees have to mandatory report. They also have a separate citation, which is the Employer of Choice for Gender Equality. And it's a voluntary leading practice or recognition program. And what it does is it design, it's designed to encourage, recognise and promote those organisations that really have an active commitment to achieving gender e equality in Australian workplaces. So I look after Australia and New Zealand. From a gender equity perspective, we decided that, you know what, we're going to um, have a look at this citation and really have a hard look at what we do as an organisation and how we stack up. So to be able to apply for that citation, we have to be compliant in the Workplace Gender Equality Act. And then we also have to show across a number of areas that we um, that we have, I suppose, measurements and, and processes in place. So we put together a strong gender equity strategy, Michelle, and 
That gender equity strategy covers uh, leadership and accountability, covers uh, the gender balance of our workforce, it covers gender pay equity, it covers support for caring, and that's not just parents, that's caring across the life cycle. That's another really interesting area on its own. We need to take a holistic viewpoint on what caring is because it's not just parents who need to have that flexible workplace. Um, leads me to the next thing about mainstream mainstreaming flexibility and we've all been thrown into the world's biggest work from home or work working remotely uh, experience. So I think, um, I think we've done and dusted with flexible work. Uh, but then there's also gender-based harassment, discrimination, sexual harassment, and driving change beyond workplace. So what are our leaders doing beyond J&J &J to really advocate and talk about the gender equity? So um, we were really fortunate. We Well, after a lot of hard work, we actually were um, awarded the citation. So one of about 140 companies in Australia to have this citation, which is a two-year citation. But I think um, what it shows is that whilst we have this gender equity strategy, it's not enough just those words on their own on paper. They need to be measured. They need to be governed. But they also need to be you know, they need to be adopted by the senior business leaders or by actually not by the senior business leaders, by all of the leaders in the organisation, whether they're senior or middle management. It needs to resonate with them. They need to be able to understand why we're doing it. So measurement is important, but measurement on its own isn't enough. It needs to be together with the stories that we tell and, and the meaning behind it. Otherwise, it um, kind of falls on... Um, on, on a little bit of deaf ears around if you just take measurement on its own without, um, you know, without those things. And I think from a gender equity perspective, you know, we tie that, we do tie those all together. I think, um, yeah, that's. Yeah, you know, and, and I would say um, Graham Parker, who is listening, just said the words on paper need to come to life. And that's just yeah. what, what you said, Fiona, which I think is so important. You know, I, I had, I, I literally had like 15 questions and I'm like, I think we're going to get through all of them. And yet yeah. we haven't, we've only scratched the surface here and we have so many questions from no. the audience. And I want to make sure that we address um, more of these because they're so good and they're kind of provocative too. And so Rasham, I want to start yeah. with one for me, for you, because I think this is a really interesting one. When you look at this, when you look at the panelists here, we're all women. Right. Yeah. And most DEI panel discussions and conferences, and this is coming from Abhishek, um, very rarely have representation from men. Is it just a coincidence? Is it that men care less? Or is it by conscious choice by the conference team? So, uh, Rasham, you want to take that one? Because I think that's, a, that's an interesting question. That is a very interesting question. And I was actually thinking about this when, um, when I walked into this panel, because I noticed that too. Although I would say that in this panel, at least we have ensured uh, this diversity of experiences. We are all coming from a different background. I come from a business background. You come from a marketing background, Michelle. Um, Fiona comes from a from a diversity background. And then there's Karen who comes from a uh, manpower group. So, so our experiences are different. We also probably have some kind of inter intersectionality going on. I'm a woman of color, but I'm also um, uh, from, um, uh, you know, but I'm also an ally. So there is this stuff that's going on. Now, I think the reason why conferences and why, why we see more women in the panel is because we want to understand the perspective of people who are trying to make a difference and, and are still in some way or form marginalized, right? Because for so long, there wasn't a space for raising our voices to tell people how we really feel and what's our perspective on diversity, that it now has become important to, to bring that to surface. 
Um, well, in the and in the process, I think we we eliminate some of the male allies that we should definitely bring in and and um, and cisgender allies as well. So that's probably something that needs to start changing very soon. But uh, but at least you know uh, from a from a perspective, and as I think about it, that's that's the key reason that comes to mind uh, because those experiences are then then not heard. You and I, Michelle, have been uh, in previous companies in our previous lives, have been probably the only women with a seat at the table and sometimes not with the voice at the table. And that is so critical now. And these forums are seen as those opportunities to, to let our male allies know the challenges that we deal with and how to address those. Hey, Michelle, can I just jump in too? Like, I love what Rashim Absolutely. said. And and um, I actually, um, for me, when I go on a panel, so um, with J&J, we're part of the Champions of Change Coalition, which used to be male Champions of Change. What they have is a panel pledge. So for me, when I get asked to go on any panel, I always ask, what's the gender diversity on the, play on the panel? What's the background on the panel? Um, in Australia, uh, any panels that I go on, I want to make sure there's an acknowledgement of country to First Nations people. So that always happens. And I always ask if we're in a large setting, uh, what um, access will there be for people um, who are like neurodiverse who can't or maybe yeah. can't uh, hearing impaired? So uh, there's some of the checks that I go through before I even commit to getting on a panel. I have to say to Rashim, though, what I it, it, it's actually unusual for me to see four women on a panel because usually I'm you know, it is um, there is more men than women. I want to call it out, though. We see this in DNI at J&J. We have predominantly more women than men, and I don't know why. I, I don't. I, I've, I have some personal thoughts. I'm always trying to get more men into DNI. Um. So yeah, I think it needs to be called out. I'm like, men, where are you? Hello. Yeah. I think I don't yeah. know. Like I want, I want them in DNI. So I don't know what's happening. I don't know. Yeah, it, it, you know, it is an it is an interesting topic, and I, I wonder sometimes um, when I think about my male colleagues if they're doing it to be deferential. When I think what we really need them to do is step up and say. I'm an ally for change. I would love to be able to talk about why I think this is important for me as a man. Um, I want to, Corinne, there's a question for you that I, I think is a good one that ties back to what we were talking about with gender balance. Um, most organizations, and this is coming from Dublina, most organizations have a recruitment strategy to improve diversity. However, a robust strategy to retain a diverse population is missing. Is something like offering alternative jobs a potential strategy? What are some of the strategies that we can look to to create a better opportunity to retain those people who might need to leave the workforce? And you talked a little bit about flexible work environments. Perhaps you can take that one. No, it's a very interesting one. And uh, I, I give you the example of Japan, where, again, we are making um, really the effort to make sure that we have a certain number of women um, uh, promoted to manager, but how can we return them? Um, I think that there are different, different things there. Um, when we are the design program, when we look at high potential program, leadership program, we have to look at from the diversity perspective. So it's not necessarily looking at a different job, but how do you build your pipeline so that you have a diverse pool of, pool of talent? Um, yeah, it's setting expectation from the start, for example, when we uh, recruit talent, and um, I think there were a few questions around talent acquisition strategy and, and policies. It starts with, do we have a panel of diverse people interviewing? How do we identify that um, we have uh, 
clear goals around diversity when we uh, put the shortlist in place. So, and it starts with all of this. Uh, then you build, you build your uh, pool of talent. Um, and then after, in terms of retention, we have to identify, um, and you, when, when we look at the metrics and there are um, lag uh, and, and leader indicator, and I think the lag indicator, if you look at your workforce and the demographic is who do you lose? Uh, who are you not capable to return and the reason why. So I think it starts with a very open conversation. Why are we not able to return? And is it for obvious reason? Or are we very open as well to be the di dialogue around the reason? Um, and it would be interesting to really dive into the data and understanding the, the reason and not to make a short, shortcut uh, saying, oh, uh, she's a, um, it's, it's a, for example, someone who's joined a team where it's pre predominantly uh, men and um, this f the, the woman doesn't feel comfortable among um, a very male dominated environment. So how does she, how um, can she be really included in, in the group discussion and, and et cetera. So I think that the data will tell us more. How do we, um, the reason why people or female leaders are not um, staying, especially in very specific role. Um, and again, it's open di dialogue and communication, which is absolutely key. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Corrine. Um, I want to move to a question, and um, I believe um, I, I, I want to pronounce this correctly, Kanan. Um, I, I want to get the tone of this question correct. So it, it is such an interesting one. So we, we yeah, talk like, about... It's a great question. Is that the one you want, Fiona? All right, I'm going to go with this one for you, Fiona. But we talk about um, about how do we hire for a more diverse workforce? What are the things that we look at in terms of job descriptions, but are we really being open to candidates who aren't coming from tier one or tier two institutes? Are those things important as we start to look at resumes? And are we actually being mindful of opening up our recruiting efforts to institutions, schools, and um, different types of skills development than kind of the traditional top end. Fiona, is that the question that you wanted to take? Um, I kind of lost that one. I was looking at one there around unconscious bias, but um, I, oh, I can see down the bottom recruitment. I'm happy to yeah, take I, that one, Michelle, if you want you me jump, to. You jump in first, Rashim, because I've got something to add there as well. So, uh, so I've been a hiring manager for over 20 years now, and I've never hired a candidate based on the college that they went to. I've mm -hmm. never, I've also hired people in highly technical role who never went to college. Because when I look for a candidate, when I look for what I want to hire for, I want to hire for attitude. I want to hire for a growth mindset. I want to hire for the thought process of a person. Because guess what? The skills are going to change in two years, what they require to be successful in this job and what this job is going to look like next two years is going to change. So I want to hire for a person who has that mindset of continuous learning, who can be a true partner in driving innovation. And, um, and really, to be honest, in my experience, I've never had challenge on that perspective. When I've created job descriptions, when we have put it out there, having a degree in computer science or having a degree in, in a particular job role has never been a criteria for us. So as, if, as you start thinking about building your teams, as you start hiring people, as you, uh, if there are people from talent acquisition team in this, in this um, participating in this leader camp today, ask those questions from a hiring manager. Ask what they're looking for. And that is the most important piece. The problem is that most of the time, what we do is we rehash job descriptions. Somebody created a job description. Let me change this and make four changes into what I require in this role. And then it takes forward, then you take it forward. 
have you created a job description from scratch to truly identify what you need in your role? And I that is the important I, piece to it. Yeah. I jump in. I jump in. I just want to, like, Rashim, I totally, um, and you know, kudos to you. I think you're a highly intellectual and really um, aware of your biases. But I know we all work with people who are totally unaware of their biases. And whether that's, you know, and, and it's not a malicious thing most of the time, it's it's because we bring our life experiences along with us. And it takes years of unlearning. I'm still checking my biases every day and unlearning yeah. those. Um, I think when it comes to recruitment, there is massive value in de-identifying um, resumes or letters that come in to the point of even taking people's names out of them, taking mm -hmm. where they've gone to university out. I think, you know, let's be honest, there is there is biases that exist. And I think, um, you know, like if we really want to make changes, then we have to be brave to make those bold moves and even just acknowledge them. I think the space of D, E and I can get really overwhelming because there is so much that we can do. And I think making those very small changes in the job description, uh, in the job adverts that you that you gave Rashim is amazing. Like we put our um, job descriptions through a similar tool, but I think, you know, the language that you use, even having down the bottom of each of your advertised jobs that um, all our jobs are flexible, all our job, we don't, we don't advertise part or full time because it, it shouldn't be like even just by saying this is a part time job, you are setting the bias towards a, you know, a, a female with children, for example, who wants to work part time. There's those biases that exist. And it's the same as when in j, &J we don't talk about um, maternity leave anymore. We talk about parental leave because, again, um, you know, we don't talk about primary and secondary carers leave because I guarantee you when we say secondary carers, most people would go, oh, that's the father. And so I think, yeah. you know, unconscious bias is so important and I really just think, you know, it's woven through and meshed through so much of what we do without even realising. Michelle, there is Can a follow-up question that I want to pick up, if you don't mind. And um, yeah, and then I want to, and then I do want to get to Kareen. Go ahead, Rashim. Okay. Uh, there's a follow-up question in terms of there are policies on tier one and tier two colleges for with a different compensation policy, and I've seen that, and I've seen that more when I was in India as opposed to when I moved over here, and this is where policies and procedures and how they are created and where we, we need to have conversation at a completely different level where we start changing those policies, where we, we are making opportunities available to everybody and not tying it to tier one and tier two colleges. There are a lot of things that come into play on that one. So I, I want to leave with that thought that, uh, that it requires a policy change. You cannot fight that battle unless you have those policy changes in place. I agree. And that's a very concrete thing that we need to do. We've got, we've got to change the way we look at job descriptions. Karina, I don't know if you want to jump into this conversation. I do have another question yeah. for you too. Uh, I had two interesting statistics on this one. Uh, it was mm -hmm. a, a survey uh, recently done. A woman applies for a job when she has 90% of requirements versus 60% for men. That's right. That's right. And it's how with this, the confidence of women to apply for jobs when they feel that, okay, I need at least the 90% to make it work. And another one, it's more on the salary. 7% of women negotiate their salary when they start their first job versus 69% of men. So I think we need to bring as well the, the confidence of women like applying for job, even if um, and they don't have necessarily all the competency, but to your point, Rashim, the soft skills and the soft skill of the future, the curiosity, the learnability, the innovation, the creativity, the agility and the flexibility, that's what we need in the future as well. 
You know, it's interesting because in this conversation, so so the chat pod is going crazy over this topic. I can see I can see a leader camp just on how do we craft job descriptions. I also see a leader camp coming up probably on this notion of return to office and flexible work environments, because these are the topics that people care about right now. Mm-hmm. And as employers, as leaders, these are things that we have to be very, very mindful of. And I want to go, there was a, a question here, and I think I lost it. And I'm going to be upset if I lost it because, and, and I will, I will apologize, but, but someone, um, I think it was, Girish and I apologize for if if I haven't pronounced that correctly, asked a question and and said, um, this may be a stupid question. So first of all, there are no stupid questions. I thought it was actually a very good question about how do we start to look at and measure this idea of belonging. And Corinne, you talked about that early on, this idea of belonging and bringing it into our conversation. So how do you start to create that environment, but then also really evaluate, are we doing the right things? to help people belong. Yeah. And then I, I know we're, we're probably almost at time, but I do want to get this, this in. Mm. Yeah. I think it's, it's all about the, the, the culture and which uh, culture you want to create in your organization. Uh, the sense of, of belonging is, is one component. So, and again, it, it's a journey creating a culture, evolving the, the, the culture and what we, we're doing at the moment. So identify like the, the three main um aspect of the, the, the culture in our organization from the leader. And then the three um, key aspects um, and feedback from our employees. And obviously to match both and to make sure that uh, we are able to answer to uh, our employees and we, we create uh, this, uh, this strong culture. Um, I think the, when we talk about belonging, um, people want to um, make sure that we hear them. So when we do survey, they, they need to hear the feedback. That's one thing. Um, and yeah, the, the, again, it, it, it's a journey and I'm just in, in there. So I don't know what I would have on, on the belonging piece, but uh, it's, it has been... Um, only I think two months ago that we've had it this. So it's very recent. We are US based uh, organization, global organization, and um, had a very interesting discussion with our global head of HR. And she was asking me, what do you think about adding the belonging? I said, yes, absolutely. Because people need to have the sense of why I'm here in this organization, the sense of purpose. Why am I doing this job? What do I contribute to? Uh, and do I contribute to a group where I'm really proud of? So being proud of working for an, an organization is absolutely key. Thank you. Hey, Michelle, I sorry, I, I typed yeah, an no, answer. Go ahead. I typed an answer. That's why you couldn't see that question because it dropped into the answered section. I was just saying that one way to measure belonging as a first point is through an in, your employee engagement surveys and inclusion index in its very raw sense. Obviously, there's more scope than beyond that to break that down, but I think that's a great starting point. Hmm. Yeah. Thank you so much, Fiona, because I'm like, I know it was here. I saw the question. <laughs> that was my fault. That was my fault. No, no, no. It's all, hey, look, we want to get as many questions answered. And I, I, I think we probably have time for one more. And this is going to go to each of you. So I want you to think about this for a moment. And I, again, I apologize if I am not pronouncing names right, but this is from um, Shagun. Uh, on the subject of publishing metrics, I love this question because we're, we're, we're talking, we're, we're in different locations in different parts of the world. Companies tend to publish metrics on this global level which might make some of our organizations seem like we're doing better than we really are. And when you start to drill down in, into particular regions, picture isn't always as good as it looks. So yeah. what are your thoughts about our DEI journey and where we are from a regional perspective? And what are some of the things that we, we need to do? And Fiona, I see you nodding. So I'm going to start with you and then I'll go to Kareen and then Rashim, I'll ask you to finish up on this one. Um, look, I would just say that I think, uh, and I said it earlier, it is a really overwhelming space, DE&I, and I think it's very easy as well to get bogged down in those metrics. So someone mentioned it earlier on, like we're all at different stages in the 
I and D, D, E, I and B, D and I journeys. I think it's about making sure that what you're doing within your organisation is the right thing for the the broad group of employees and is embraced and endorsed by your senior leaders and your people managers across the organisation. So, um, you know, if there's stats or if there's measurements and reporting that kind of filters down that it doesn't look like it's translating to your organisation is maybe take a look at what you're doing um, and connect with your employees because it's that connection piece that really will drive then what you do as a result. You shouldn't be doing it because some figure somewhere or some person says, you know, Fiona and Corinne and Rashim say do this, it might not be the right thing for your organisation. That's kind of my takeaway. Right. Corinne? Yeah, and I'm, I'm looking at the metrics at three different levels. It's absolutely fundamental we have global objective. And I take the one on gender balance. Um, globally, we want to achieve 40% of leaders female in our organization. When I take this into our region, I have to take it realistically. I can't go to Japan and say, I want to achieve 40%. And I was very open with the head of Japan and say, if you achieve the 20%, I would be very happy. Because you have to look at where they're coming from and what is realistic to achieve given the culture, given the background, given it's all entire society in Japan. And I'm not here to change the society. It would be too, 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 too big a um, uh, job for me to do this. So I think if you're not putting realistic goals for the country, so I have as well a regional objective, but then down to the country level, if you're not making this goal smart, this will not, things won't change. So it's really opening the dialogue. Where are we coming from? How are we evolving? And who do we involve in the entire organization? So I'm looking at this yeah, different element and breaking down, and I'm doing this for all country. And again, Australia with 40%, I won't be happy. It should be above 40%. It's a, it should be above 50%. And that's what we're doing at the moment. We're above 50%. And I'm proud that we're achieving this. But if I say it's 40% in Australia, for me, that's not enough. So again, we have to be really mindful about the local culture, when, especially when you work for a global organization, because not what one size fits all, it's one size fits one. Mm -hmm. Rochelle, I want to take a slightly uh, different turn on this one for you. So there's a question from Margaret, and I, I hope I interpret this correctly. Are, and it kind of goes back to what Corinne just said, are we pushing for too much cultural change too fast in that leaders really want cultural change? We want to see these metrics here. We, we, we want to be above this point, but are we really, you know, everybody's at a very different starting point. So how do we understand and acknowledge that cultural change happens over time and this is not something that we're going to be able to affect overnight uh that's a good question and um and really michelle for me as i see it it's it's the intent behind those numbers that matters you yeah. know numbers are important data is important but how we get to those numbers is important I've been part of many large organizations where, where numbers were met. Uh, there were diverse people on the team, but they really didn't have the voice at the table. They were not part of the conversation. And do those numbers then make any sense, right? So as organizations start thinking about, about the journey, I would rather have people take a lower number, not go aggressive on the number, but go aggressive on the intent, on the mindset change, on how we go beyond diversity and think about inclusion and belonging because those are the key drivers to change. And that's why sometimes that making that business case is so hard because you've done your diversity hires, but really you're not seeing any ROI on that. And that's because you haven't taken it the next, taken the next step in the process. You haven't 
built the culture of inclusion. You haven't built that culture of belonging. So these people whom you have hired now feel uncomfortable in the situation. They don't have voice. They're covering up, they're code switching, and they're not bringing their authentic self to work, which means that the whole purpose of doing those diversity hires is lost. So I often say this, that certifications are great, but what leads you to that path of certification, how you get to that certification, the knowledge and the mindset that you build is the most important piece of it. So that's the thought that I want to leave everybody with, Michelle, today. Thank you. And, and on that note, I, I, gosh, what, a, what an amazing session. It went by so quickly. Fiona and Karine, thank you so much for participating today. I feel like this was such a good session for us all. And I'm so grateful that, that, that you were here. And to everybody who joined us, thank you for taking the time out of your schedules to be here. I want to recognize you, our attendees, um, in particular, who joined and participated at a, at a very difficult time for so many who are still in the midst of this pandemic. Um, this work, I think, is so powerful when it's done in solidarity with each other. And for those of you who've been here for the two days, I, I hope you found this insightful and valuable. You know, I, I think our speakers and our panelists have offered some tangible and practical ways in which hopefully you can advance your own programs. I think the good news is that we're having these conversations and we're having more about diversity, equity, inclusion and belonging and the steps that organizations need to take to create more inclusive workplaces. And I think the challenge now is for us to translate this dialogue into action and commit to progress and meaningful change. We uh, at Skillsoft, we are proud sponsors of this leader camp because we believe that value um, comes from the unique strengths and talents of every individual. And we're committed to strong, positive action to advance, nurture, and sustain cultures that appreciate and champion DEI. So on behalf of both Skillsoft and People Matters, I wanna thank you so much for joining us today. Be safe and be well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michelle. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for moderating the session so well, Michelle. Yes, indeed. It was a very insightful session. So much to learn from, from each one of our speakers. DEI are no longer considered nice to have, especially during these uncertain times. Reinforcing robust DEI programs helps every employee to show up each day without be, the fear of being their true selves. So that's really important in these days. So thank you so much once again, Fiona, Kareen, Michelle and Rashim for the wonderful insights. And a special thanks for taking our time. We are all joining us from different time zones. So thank you so much for taking our time from your schedules to help us with some thought-provoking ideas. Well, what a wonderful learning leader camp we've had. Before we wrap up for the day, I invite Rashim again to help us close the week with her final notes. Rashim, would you please like to give the final notes before we close? Oh, uh, I mean, I am so energized. I, I am looking at these questions and I'm thinking, Oh my God, I wish I could answer all of them. And my LinkedIn is full of requests. So uh, I'm going at a slow pace here, people. So bear with me, but I'm, I'll make sure that I'll get to all the LinkedIn requests and the questions today. As, as you think about this and as you wrap it up, please don't make this about this one leader camp where you, where you learned something. Think about it as a journey that you are on of continuous learning, of building that culture of allyship, of building that culture of inclusion, because ultimately what we all want is an equal world for all. And that's what we are committed to. So everything that you do moving forward, think about small little steps that you can take to move forward and make this world an equal world. Lovely, lovely thoughts. Thank you so much, Rashim. On that note, it's time to wrap up. I would like to thank our partner, Skillsoft, who helped us stitch this deep learning journey. Skillsoft delivers online learning, training, and talent solutions to help organizations unleash their edge. Leveraging immersive, engaging content, Skillsoft enables organizations to unlock the potential in their best assets, their people, and build teams with the skills they need for success. Empowering 36 million learners and counting, Skillsoft democratizes learning through an intelligent learning experience and a customized learner-centric approach to skills development with resources for leadership development, business skills, technology and development, digital transformation and compliance. 
for our audience, we request you to go to section four of the platform and apply your reflections and learnings that help us with your feedback. Section 4.1 is the reflections and section 4.2 is for feedback. The platform is open until next week for you. You can browse the platform for sharing your learnings with us. The recording for all the session will also be available on the platform from early next week. You'll be receiving information from the team on it. We wish to come back with yet another season full of new ideas and opportunities for you very soon. And this, with this, we are going to wrap up our leader camp. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. Have a great day ahead and stay safe.